Hey guys, welcome back to Supposedly Fun. I'm Greg. It is April 1st, and I am not here to do an April Fool's Day joke on you. I would never do that. I do not like April Fool's Day jokes. I am here instead to do my wrap-up for the month of March. Now, I've been doing really well. I honestly think BookTube is helping me have some accountability in my reading because I, I, am on pa I am on track to have the biggest reading year I've ever had since I started keeping track of these things. I finished seven books in March, did DNF two books, but I got far enough into both of those books that I'm going to include them on the list of books that I read for the year and for this month. So let's just get to the books that I read. And I'm going to do this in descending order, starting with the ones that I liked the least and building up to the one that I liked the best. Here we go. Now, interestingly, I only actually have one copy of a book I read in March in physical form because this was a big library month for me. But anyway, the book that I liked the least in the month of March was Tangerine by Christine Mangan. This is one of the DNFs, but I got halfway through it, so like I said, that's enough for me to count it. And um, guys, I tried. I really tried. I really wanted to like this book. I had high hopes for it because the Jackie copy describes it to Patricia Highsmith, and I like Patricia Highsmith. I that sounded really appealing to me. Instead, I kind of I thought this book was kind of a mess. I thought it was really predictable, um, and I thought it was heavily, heavily relying on one of my least favorite mystery cliches that comes up, which is that it deliberately withholds information from you as the reader, but teases you with that knowledge. So in this book. It alternates between two different viewpoints of viewpoints of female characters where they were roommates in college and they were best friends like BFFs for life and something happened that made them break up their friendship and one of them move away and end up marrying a man and going ending and moving to Morocco just to get away and they won't tell you what happened which one is annoying and two, makes it really impossible to believe that the quote-unquote villainous character would just show up on the other one's doorstep and be allowed back into her life. Because, especially once you start to get to what the secret is, why? Why, why after what happened, would you let this person into your life? It just doesn't make sense. And it's, I didn't really like a lot of the descriptive style. Um, and I thought the, the villain character is kind of a tired retread of that old queer villain trope that has been all too prevalent in literature. I just, I just didn't like this book. So I felt like I could have tried to finish it, but it was making me so mad that it wouldn't be worth my time. That is Tangerine by Christine Mangan by Forever. Coming in at number six is The Age of Miracles by Karen Thompson Walker. I did not like this one either. I'd heard really good things about it, so maybe my expectations were set a little high. The premise of it sounds interesting, and that is that the Earth's rotation slows. And, of course, that has wide-ranging impacts on the world. It looks like the world could potentially be coming to an end. But the way the book is handles, the, handles that feels odd to me. And I, I, I talked about this at length in another review. I'll link that up top. Um, so I don't want to get into it too much here. Suffice to say, the um, ahem, gravity of the situation never really feels like it sinks in with these characters. And I think part of what Karen Thompson Walker is doing is trying to make a point about how you know, climate change is real. We're looking at a 20, 20 years from the point in time I'm making this video, and there could be cataclysmic change at the end of it. But we don't really take that seriously. We kind of continue with our lives. So I think she's trying to portray that, but it just, it's, the way it plays out in the book does not feel right to me. Like, people, society starts to break down because people can't agree on how to tell time once the Earth's rotation slows down. And it's just like, is that really where the fault line would be? I don't know. I just I, I just couldn't get on board with this book. So I did finish it, but I didn't relish the experience. Um, this could be a contender for one of my worst books, uh, or least favorite books of the year. We'll see how the rest of the year goes. All right, and coming in at number five is Leading Men by Christopher Castellani. Now, I already talked about this book as well, so I'm going to be brief with it here. I'll link to the other video up top. Um, but I was really excited about this book going in. So it's really a big disappointment to me that I DNF this. Basically my problem with this book is this. It promises to be about Tennessee Williams and his lover Frank Merlot and in three different time periods. Um, when they're on vacation in Italy in 1953, ten years later when Frank Merlot is dying of cancer and kind of waiting to see Tennessee Williams one last time possibly. 
and then a story in the present day when with a fictional character and a fictional unpublished play of Tennessee Williams comes to, about Frank Merlot comes to light. The problem is it uses a fictional character in all of those time periods to really get at a lot of the themes, and I don't think Castellani needed this character, and she just drags all of the action to a halt, and she ends up becoming the focus of the book, and I was really interested in the parts of the book that are about Tennessee and Frank, but every time it went to this other character, Anya, I just wanted to stop reading, and because she ends up being such a focus of the book, and honestly, a crutch for Castellani, I, I just was stalled reading this and had to eventually give up because I just wasn't getting anywhere with it. So that's Leading Men by Christopher Castellani. And then there's another book that I already talked about. I'll link the description to that up top. It's Small Fry by Lisa Brennan Jobs. Lisa Brennan Jobs' big claim to fame is that she is Steve Jobs' daughter, the one that he denied paternity of, and a DNA test uh, ordered by the court proved that he is the father. And uh, one thing that really fascinated me about this book is that I, I am a foster father. And Lisa talking about her childhood reminds me of a foster kid. She has all the symptoms and experiences that a foster kid would have, but she was raised by her biological parents, and that to me is fascinating. But I felt like the book kind of peters out in the end. Lisa Brennan Jobs doesn't really build to anything poignant. There's no really big conclusion, and I feel like even though she does not get closure with Steve Jobs, who obviously died of cancer, it, it, there's just nothing there. The lack of closure could have been the conclusion of this book, but she doesn't really say anything, ultimately. And while the, as, as interesting as I found the rest of the book, I just I wanted something poignant at the end of the book. And the book that comes in at number three has the opposite problem. The library book by Susan Orlean has a very poignant opening and closing. There's a lot of interest in between, but it lacks focus. And as much as I really liked the library book, I just wanted it to be tightened up a little bit. And so ostensibly this book is about the library fire that ravaged LA's Central Library in 1986, causing millions of dollars of damage and the, the countless books to be lost. But it's also about the resilience of libraries, the importance of libraries, which is something I really believe in. And although it's ostensibly about that fire, it's about so much more. It's about what libraries do for communities, and it's about the history of libraries, and potentially the future of libraries. And it goes back, and it talks about Susan Orlean's personal history with libraries, and it talks about heads of the Los Angeles Library pretty much going one by one by one up to the present day, and the things that the, their goals and aspirations and the ways they changed the library. And it's, it's very sprawling. And while all of it is interesting, it feels like there's too much. I think a little more focus would have helped me with this book. Coming in at number two is All That Heaven Allows by Mark Griffin. This is a biography of Rock Hudson. And this is a very strict traditional biography. It does it, It's going to give you Rock Hudson's life, and that's pretty much all it's going to give you. But it does it so well and so cleanly, and it is so thoroughly researched that you don't really care that it doesn't go into a whole lot of other things. As far as it goes outside of the actual biography of Rock Hudson is that it does talk about the impact of him being the first really widely visible celebrity person who died of the AIDS epidemic, which was previously seen as like a gay man's disease. And um, although Rock Hudson was a gay man, the fact that he had been a sex symbol for women and such, such a revered celebrity in the 60s, it really changed perception about gay men and AIDS victims, and in amazing ways, just really big ways. It was a very pivotal thing, uh, unfortunately for Rock Hudson. But in, and the impact wouldn't happen right away, but over time, he really challenged the stereotypical view of a gay man and uh, made awareness, like because of his um, because of his death from AIDS, Elizabeth Taylor started AMFAR to help fight the AIDS epidemic, and he he ended up living his life in the closet and having a very big impact afterwards. But that's as much as the book goes into his overall impact and how we look at Rock Hudson today. And that, to me, is enough. That and I think he had a really interesting life, and talking about his life in the closet really gives you a sense of how people lived in the past and how some people still live today. I thought it was very interesting. And I, I thought it was also interesting that the book the structures itself almost by going movie to movie to movie throughout Rock Hudson's career and it uses why he decides to do that movie 
the experience of making that movie and the reception of that movie as a sort of catalyst to explore everything else that goes on in Rock Hudson's life. And that's really interesting because in a lot of ways he was a very, he was a very dedicated actor. So his work did frame his life. It, 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 it's, just, it's a structure that works and makes it really interesting. It's as much about his movies as it is about him. And really the two are so intertwined that you can't separate them anyway. I just thought it was a very interesting book and I would re definitely recommend it. And coming in at number one is Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. I, I compare this book to Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin, I, I, which is a book I've talked about a lot on this channel, so you can expect to hear a lot about Ghost Wall, probably. Uh, I will link my full review to it up top, but I just, I really, really enjoyed this book. It's about a teenage girl named Sylvie. Her full name is Sulevea, which is a very ancient na uh, name. Uh, one of the fun things about it is it's supposed to be an ancient British name, but the other college students that she's hanging around, uh, she's not a college student, I don't know why I said other college students, um, kind of debate the origin of the name. It might not actually be British. And uh, th that's one of the interesting things about this book, because it's about, uh, so Sylvie and her mother and her domineering father are p kind of latching on to a sort of archaeological expedition. It's not an expedition, and it's not super archaeological, but it, she, they latch onto a college professor and three college students who are trying to live as people did in the Iron Age in Northern England. And, of course, they can't 100% pull it off because the world has changed drastically since it did during the Iron Age. Um, they don't 100% know how people did live, what they wore, so all they can do is really speculate. And I thought this was really interesting because I think it also gets to a larger idea of how much can we ever really know anybody. Not just his historically, but anybody. You know, I, I can interpret what might be in somebody else's head or how they live their life. But I can't 100% know it, and I just thought that was really interesting. And as the book goes, it starts to feel, maybe, I read this when I was sick, so maybe that exacerbated this, but it feels surreal, even though nothing surreal is happening. And it builds tension, and you just can't stop flipping the pages to find out what's going to happen next. Uh, obviously there are family tensions with Sylvie and her family. Her father is not an academic, he just, he idealizes the past to this kind of scary degree. And um, the, the tensions are exacerbated by the presence of Molly, who is one of the college students. Um, Sylvie has a, an attraction to her, and Sylvie is kind of coming of age herself, which is already causing problems with her father, but she's terrified that people are going to realize that she's attracted to Molly. And Molly is this very modern girl. She kind of rejects the notion of living with, as people did in the past, um, even though she's gone along on this trip. And she's a, a, a part of why is that she doesn't really want to live as women did in the past because women are subjugated in the past and she's like we've moved we've moved beyond that why is it why are we doing this and her modern attitude causes tension among the professor and the students and it, within Sylvie's family and I might not one hundred percent believe where that tension goes. And what happens in the end, everything kind of explodes. But I did feel that it built to something that I don't. It's hard, weird to call it satisfying. <laughs> but it, but I I left this book feeling like gut punched, and I've been thinking about it, which is probably the, bit, the best thing you can say about a book. And I definitely recommend it. I will be thinking about this book for a long time, as I said, and I will absolutely definitely be checking out more of Sarah Moss's writing. I really enjoyed this. By the way, this is the cover of the book in the UK. Uh, I was having trouble finding a good resolution copy of uh, the book cover in the US, which looks very different from this. Um, so there you go. But anyway, really enjoyed this. Definitely recommend it. Uh, it's. It, I think it'll be a contender for one of my favorite books of the year, along with my favorite book from February. So that's what I read in the month of March. How did you do in the month of March? Is there anything you read that you would recommend? I'd definitely like, like to know what you've been reading, if there's anything good that you think I should be keeping my eye on, anything you're looking forward to in April. There are two books coming out this month that I'm really looking forward to. Women Talking by Miriam Toes and uh, Normal People by Sally Rooney is coming out as well in the US. And as always, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it and you liked what you saw, uh, please consider subscribing or watching some of my other videos if you're a returning subscriber. I appreciate your time and I appreciate you and I will be back again 
Until then, happy reading, everybody.